welcome to our session. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Jeff Mayo. I work at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Co-presenters, introduce yourselves. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Joe Oliver. Uh, I'm the Transfer Student Success Program Director at Baylor University, which is about uh, two hours-ish away from um, University of Texas. Yeah. Hi, I'm Brandi Carr. I'm the Transfer Coordinator in Advising Services at West Texas A&M University, and I'm quite a bit further away. I'm about an eight-hour drive from where they're located. Yeah, so not, not quite as far as you can get in Texas. You can get you about a 20-hour drive across our state, but uh, uh, still uh, colleagues across the state. So, um, But we're really excited to talk to you all today. Um, this past uh, year and a half or so, we have uh, worked together on a uh, Transfer Student Leadership Summit. And so uh, what we hope to c cover today is to talk about um, uh, what was really the impetus for, for starting this event, um, its purpose, how we got started, some of our strategic planning involved, um, getting the participant perspective um, from Joe and Brandy, uh, some of our assessment tools, uh, lessons learned as we go into year two, uh, which our second summit is coming up in two weeks from tomorrow and uh, also kind of talking about our growth and collaboration along the way. So why an event for students? Um, this really first came uh, at NISTS two years ago, uh, sitting around in the sessions, and I was gaining so much from um, shared best practices and uh, networking with other transfer-minded folks like yourselves, uh, and I just thought to myself, um, really, the, I think this would be beneficial if we had our students participate. Um, at UT Austin, uh, the real kind of agents for change for transfer students are the students themselves. Uh, they are really their best advocates on our, our campus. Uh, our office, or our program, the Transfer Your Experience program, actually started from a student senate resolution that was passed that uh, helped define the, the gap and transfer services uh, that made its way to the president's office and that brought the funding to start our program. Um, so our students really have been a, a huge player on our campus for transfer support. Uh, and then looking for the, the purpose of the event and thinking through um, uh, for students was really to amplify the student voice. Our students, like your students, I'm sure, have their own voices and they don't need me to give them a voice. <laughs> Uh, but whatever I could do to help amplify their voices uh, is what we wanted to do. Uh, spread ideas and initiatives to new campuses, so uh, similar to NISTS, uh, where you can learn about a program that you've never heard of before, bring it back to your campus, or maybe it's something that you're already doing, but uh, there's a little tweak you can make to improve that service. Uh, that's the idea behind there. Uh, build a proud and informed statewide peer network. Uh, uh, this gets into a little bit more we'll talk about later, but um, uh, helping build strength in the identity of being a transfer student, so being very straightforward and labeling the event for transfer students and that it's something that they should have uh, pride in and that they should build their strength from is something that was important to us to build their confidence around a transfer identity. And then experience a professional and supportive conference environment. So um, I think NISTS, uh, as another example, is a very welcoming environment, even for new professionals, uh, to present their ideas, to put together a call for proposals. Uh, and I think we could all agree that if we had some of those experiences as undergraduates, it, would, it would, might make that, even, uh, that experience more valuable once you become a, a professional. And so the idea was to create, regardless of the content, regardless if we're talking about uh, transfer student issues or not, to give them that uh, professional conference experience was important. And these are four objectives that, as we'll get into some of the, the talking about planning and strategic um, project management later, uh, these are four of the objectives that we started with and that we want to stick true to. Uh, and so it's something that we, we try to revisit as we um, uh, look to plan and grow the event. So for strategic planning, um, this was something that, uh, as a graduate student, I, I, I picked up um, a, a document and some tips uh, when I worked for our 
uh, planning office on campus. And these are, uh, by no means am I a project management um, expert, and I'm sure there's people in this room who have their PMP certificates or whatnot, and, uh, but th these are just some tools that I use in my planning that uh, helped me along the way. Uh, doing a lot of the work up front made it much easier once things started moving, uh, and also thinking through my goals and my objectives uh, and always using those to inform what we were doing uh, made things much easier down the road. So some of the first steps were uh, benchmarking and scanning. So by that, uh, I started by talking to our students. So what would the students want to get at an, at an event that would be built around transfer students and, and connecting with their peers? And so uh, a desire to meet other students was a huge thing for them to talk about the, the transfer experience. Uh, to see if students at other schools experienced the same challenges. If so, how did they overcome them? Uh, or were there things that were unique to UT Austin that we needed to work on uh, as well? Uh, recognition of uh, transfer as a unique experience. Uh, uh, I know on our campus, uh, we can do a much better job of acknowledging our transfer students' uh, presence, let alone their, their excellence, and so by creating a uh, interinstitutional event where we could recognize transfer students was important to them. And then talking about a diversity of leadership roles. So as I had mentioned, our program was pretty new at this point. Uh, transfer student leadership was kind of a new concept to our, our campus, and they wanted to learn more about what do transfer student leaders look like and what are their roles on other campuses uh, across Texas. So then, our office started to look at what is already being done. Um, I'll fast forward to the answer, not a lot in, in this realm. Uh, Tau Sigma does have a, a, student, a leadership conference um, that's tied uh, with the work that those chapters do. Um, but the idea of this was to look beyond those roles and a diversity from transfer housing to admissions ambassadors to uh, student government. So. Uh, uh, when looking at that, we didn't really find a, a lot going on. We did find, uh, when we were looking at Texas in particular, our state's Higher Education Coordinating Board had brought together um, university presidents and provosts to talk about transfer student um, uh, challenges and some of the uh, sticking points during the uh, transfer. But, uh, Presidents and provosts aren't exactly the front line to our student issues, and so uh, in, in many of those cases, our student leaders are that, are that front line, our, 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 our mentors, our ambassadors, our student leadership, and so it was important for us to, um, it was important enough for presidents and provosts to come together, it was important enough to bring our students together, so. Uh, and then we started to look at, uh, uh, for scanning, for an external and internal review um, to, to see if we're meeting our needs. So for uh, the external environment, it was, um, uh, are there an, uh, enough schools uh, in Texas to do something like this? Do enough schools have folks that we could reach out to to help organize the event? Um, internally, uh, is our campus um, equipped to, to host this event? Who on our campus will we bring in uh, who works with transfer students. Um, we all come from different areas. I know there's representations here from uh, student affairs, from academic affairs, from libraries, from uh, faculty members. So there's a lot of folks that you have to keep in mind when you're trying to, to think of um, who's currently working with transfer students on campuses. So uh, the next two slides, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the project management side um, of the strategic planning. So. Um, and you have a handout that I provided, and um, uh, if you didn't get one, I think we have some still in the back, but it talks about um, most of the pieces on this first slide, so on the planning, planning end of things, uh, these are just really great tools that I found when trying to put together an event to really help you stick to your, your purpose. Um, so the first one I want to discuss, I won't talk, talk about each of these points in depth, but um, first is uh, goals and success indicators. So um, tying back to our purpose of um, 
the first one about amplifying student voices, what, I had to think of what would be a goal that's directly related to that purpose. Um, so it would be having students give their uh, presentations. So these wouldn't be staff presenting to students, this would be students presenting to students. Um, and then thinking of success indicators related to that, um, we had metrics based on the number of presentations given, um, how many of the institutions in attendance were represented in the presentations, uh, which types of offices or programs were represented, uh, but also uh, on the feedback of um, you know, the quality of the presentation. So we, uh, we work with students' proposals to make sure that the strong proposals and that they're going to go into the sessions uh, prepared as presenters. Uh, going on to scope, um, this is another one, uh, kind of project management type term that I was not as familiar with. Uh, but the idea really would be thinking of what is in the scope of the event and what is outside the scope of the event. Um, and actually defining the things that were outside the scope actually ended up being more helpful to me than defining what was inbounds for this event. So uh, some of the early conversations we had were, uh, would this event be for four-year schools exclusively or would we, would we invite two-year schools to participate as well? We ended up coming down on the side of really focusing on four-year schools. We did have representatives, uh, staff and students from Austin Community College nearby to kind of um, uh, test the waters for them, and it, it did end up being helpful, um, but really wanted to focus on, these are students who are um, running programs or they are the leadership of many of the programs that are helping their students, and that was the pr purpose of the event was to have those students present and inform uh, each other on best practices and sharing information, so um, that's one example. Another one for in scope or out of scope was so if all these students are gonna be coming um, from across Texas, most, if not all, we're gonna bring staff or faculty with them. So should we have a track for staff? I quickly realized that would be putting on two conferences at once, <laughs> and the idea of even getting one event up was daunting enough, so we decided quickly that the staff would be there and participate, there would be some informal connections, but there wouldn't be official programming designed for the staff members. And then finally thinking of who would the event, um, you know, geographically how far would we go for this event, who would be included. So uh, at first the idea was maybe for the UT system. Um, so we have, oh, I want to say eight um, undergraduate academic universities in the UT uh, system. Uh, however, uh, I wasn't sure how many would be able to participate. Uh, UT El Paso is a 10 hour drive at least away. Um, and a lot of other campuses aren't terribly close to Austin. And so if we were gonna expand all the way across the state, we thought we'd open it up to schools across Texas. So that's how we kind of ended up on that. But um, these were all questions that I was really glad that we answered early on instead of putting up registration and having to think about that after the fact that people were already registering for the event. Um, some of these pieces I don't believe are included on the handout However, uh, they're really great to consider early on as well. So th thinking through a timeline, uh, when I returned from uh, NISTS two years ago, it was uh, still pr pretty early on. I came back, I was motivated. Uh, the summer, things may have slowed down with my motivation while other things were on the front burner. So uh, really, we started talking about this again at the beginning of the fall semester. So that gave me uh, about a semester and a half really to think through um, where do I need to be by October, November, December, uh, leading up to our event that was held at the end of March. Uh, it was March 31st to April 1st of last year. Uh, and making sure that I had important benchmarks that really need to be hit by certain dates. Um, smaller benchmarks along the way to help motivate me. I'm very much motivated by checking off boxes. Uh, and so having as many uh, uh, sub points along the way that I could check the box off was really helpful for me. And then um, another point on this slide I wanted to touch on is sustainability and maintenance. Um, so by planning events, uh, uh, especially when we're inviting other folks on ca campus, um, what would be sustainable for the next year? So what would uh, all this effort, uh, would it be, replicable isn't the word, but uh, would it be able to be used the following year? 
Uh, so those were some of the conversations. We've talked about perhaps the event moving to different campuses in Texas, um, but the amount of work our program put into it, it just didn't make sense to move it from year to year. Maybe you plan it for two years or three years on a certain campus and then it can move because you want to get the most mileage out of all that effort you're putting into hosting it at your campus. Um, yeah. Uh, and so then building interinstitutional partnerships. Um, to be honest, I hadn't quite thought this through until we were going through this document of, um, you know, there are, um, you know, hundreds of four-year schools in Texas. And so, um, and how do I identify who, not everyone has something that's as easily labeled as a transfer year experience program like our office. And to be honest, if you even Google University of Texas at Austin transfer, we're not on the first page on the Google uh, results because it's transfer admissions, it's transfer for graduate school, all these different things pop up. So it's not as simple as just putting in Baylor transfer and Joe's picture popped up, uh, um, although they're really missing out there, they should do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was thinking through how could I reach out to folks. So first it was just the people I did know. Um, so. Uh, actually, a colleague of mine that uh, Joe had met uh, before I had started my position uh, shared his information with me. Uh, so he was one of the first people I could reach out to. Uh, but I also reached out to other folks in the Austin area, uh, folks I had worked with at University of Texas at San Antonio prior to this, uh, just to get an idea of this, is this something you'd be interested in? How many students would you think you would want to bring? Uh, and then when those minimum resources uh, uh, were depleted. I reached out through the Association for the Study of Transfer Students. We may have received an email about a week ago saying do not reach out to this list uh, for your own mail serve. Uh, I didn't use that list. I used the list uh, of membership uh, for people who joined ASTS and it's not the who attended NISTS. So I'm pretty sure I found a loophole and I feel good about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, even then that list did not include um, uh, the institution it had name and email address. Uh, so for the hundreds and hundreds of members of ASTS, I had a student worker uh, Google email address, uh, I guess suffixes, um, <laughs> so that I, I don't know what stsu.edu is, and so uh, we had to Google what some of these uh, email addresses were to see who's in Texas. Um, so it took a little creativity, and I think um, that's something we learned along the way is you have to be creative sometimes to make this work. But um, that actually gave me a, a good list of 50 schools to work with um, uh, that had academic advisors, it had faculty, it had transfer staff, it had housing staff, um, really people from across the board uh, that work with transfer students in some way. So that was super helpful. Uh, planning out our first communication, uh, we really just sent out a feeler. It was um, a terribly long email, uh, but it basically asked, is this something you'd be interested in? What types of things do you think your students might want to present on? And then talking about maybe some logistical things of, you know, could you make it to Austin? What time of year would be good for you? Uh, and then finally, um, uh, meeting in person. So. Any opportunity you have uh, to meet in person when you're doing an interinstitutional event uh, to take advantage. So uh, I met Joe for the, in person for the first time at NISTS last year. It was about two months before the, the event. Uh, I also met Val Coleman from Texas A&M. And so it was really the first time we could talk and really talk about what the purpose of the event was, what they hope to get out of it. Uh, it was, and it was super helpful to just find that time to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, um, and so these are just a couple of, of quotes we're gonna have up. I think we have time to break now um, to, for uh, our, our activity. So that, that sheet that we handed out to y'all, and again, if you didn't get one, we have some in the back. Just wanted to break for a, a good six, seven minutes uh, to give you time to walk through. So knowing that we'll cover some more about how our event actually um, worked. But for the planning portion, to think if you were to host a similar event, or if you have any interest in hosting a uh, citywide, statewide, regionwide event for, your, for transfer student leaders, um, what that might look like. And so 
um, kind of wanted to break and let you all um, talk. If you're, if you, hopefully you're with someone maybe from your institution or from a, um, someone nearby your area, uh, you can talk through it with them or just talk to your partner about their ideas too. But we'll break for you to fill out that form to the best of your ability for uh, six or seven minutes. And then we'll, um, we'll share out some of those ideas that y'all have um, before we continue. All right. Um, we're going to keep moving forward. Um, can I grab one of those uh, sheets? So does anyone want to share um, what they talked about? It could be about um, what their goals might be for a, a student conference, um, what constraints maybe you see um, to host one at your school. Um, anyone want to share? Awesome. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Bernard. Uh, I think that so I don't think anything like this. I, so I just got into this role of working with in the transfer office at my institution, and I don't think anything like this exists for them. And but I think it's so important um, for the same reason why you guys started Joyce. Um, I think one of our biggest constraints might be like funding, and so I'm hoping. Wait, I don't know if you guys already talked about that. <laughs> um, so uh, Bernard shared that one of the constraints might be funding for an event like this. Um, I am. I was hoping to avoid uh, talking about <laughs> budgets and funding, but um, uh, I, I will say, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it later on, that um, we were able to do it relatively inexpensively. Um, I know all campuses are different. On our campus, um, our student union is funded through other departments, meaning uh, we have to pay for our rooms. The union doesn't have their own budget line. We pay for our rooms. So I had to get creative on finding space that I didn't have to pay money for. Um, we also, as you'll see in a second, um, worked around meal times instead of working in meal times. <laughs> um, and that saves a ton of money. Um, I mean, really, when you get down to it, we did have some food, and we were able to find funding for that. Um, uh, but printing was inexpensive. Um, uh, things like that. So uh, we were able to do it on the cheap. But, so with the state or the, the, of the universities that attended, um, did you find that, because you know, you mentioned that one of them, like one, even your campus is like 10 hours away, did they find that to be getting their students there? Yeah. So the question was about, um, for the participating uh, schools, about finding the budget and finding the uh, resources to do that. And I think Brandy wanted to Say a few words on that. So that was, we we're about eight or 10 hours away. Um, that for us may, meant we had at least a couple of motel rooms each night because we needed two nights. Um, we still did it, I mean, I'll just tell you, it was about $1,500 for us. Um, most of that was hotels. We put quite a few students, small groups, which we'll talk about. Um, there were five of us total, is that correct? Um, so the biggest was the hotel rooms, travel, I mean, rental cars, gas, um, and meals. We were, you know, fast food when we stopped uh, because we paid. I know some schools don't, but we pay for anything with student travel. Uh, but it was a challenge, um, and it continues to be a challenge for us that not every year um, we will have approval to do so. Um, and I think it's one of those things that you have to be really thinking ahead on, really promoting that it is for students and that how it's beneficial to students um, to get funding. But yes, I mean, we budgeted around 1500 uh, for us to travel. Any other kind of, one, anything last before we move on? Yes. Did you limit the number of people who could come? Yes, so we asked that schools limit it to five total people each. Um, we did make a couple of exceptions for maybe six, um, but that was a way that we could help um, anticipate our costs. Good question. All right, so what actually happened? Um, to talk a little bit about the structure of our event, um, uh, the lessons learned, then you'll hear from uh, Joe and Brandy on their experience, and we'll talk about the impact and assessment we used. So um, it was, it was uh, structured to be two half days. We did it on a Friday and a Saturday. Um, we wanted to start 
uh, day one later in the day uh, to accommodate for folks to travel. Um, the way Texas is set up, Austin is kind of about three hours away from a lot of things. And so we thought if most people could leave that morning, uh, we would save them the cost of a second uh, hotel stay. Not the case for Brandy. Um, uh, so her hotel costs were doubled. But um, that was important to us and why we didn't do a full day on Friday. Um, as you can see, we, um, we started about midday, uh, went through an opening session, which is actually, um, you know, that hour was really well spent. Um, we'll talk about some of the informal pieces we got there, but it was really a way for students to start talking about the transfer experience, not even in their leadership roles, but just, um, you know, what was, I think we asked literally, what's the good, the bad, and the ugly of your transfer experience? Um, and uh, what were the best resources on your campus, um, whether it's the, the, the program that they were they are representing or not. Um, we started going into our uh, breakout sessions. That's where the students were presenting uh, on, their, on their programs. We ended that night with a, uh, ended up being a quick networking type event. Uh, we learned to make some more time for that. Uh, but we invited a keynote speaker from our campus and we made a, uh, a point for it not to be about transfer. Um, we wanted it to be something that they could take back feeling um, empowered and feeling um, motivated. So we brought in Dr. Michael Starbird, who's from our math department. He has written a book, um, or co-written a book called Five Elements of Effective Thinking. Uh, and it has some really great points. He's a very dynamic speaker. He's won all of our institutional and system-wide teaching awards, um, a great guy. Especially great that he would come out after 5 o'clock on a Friday um, uh, for, for no real uh, fee involved there. So we were happy to have that. Um, but we ended that day, as you can see, before dinner uh, to avoid those costs. Uh, day two really started off simple with uh, breakfast. Um, and then two sessions. And then the closing session. So the closing, we took information from our first session where they talked about their experience and brought it back um, um, together. Uh, we also um, had some folks come up and talk about their experience. And we ended it with uh, an assessment that the students walked away with um, a tangible plan when they got back to their campus, which I thought was a really great idea that I think was shared by um, uh, Dr. Smith from UT Arlington, uh, where he, he had used this before, and that um, not only are you, is it a reflection piece, but it takes it one step further, and it's when I come into campus, what do I want to accomplish? Who do I need to contact immediately to start making that happen? Who else am I gonna bring on as uh, resources and advocates for this change? Um, and then setting some uh, early benchmarks on, if I want to get this done, when do I need to hit certain points? So it was a really fun document that the students could walk away with having already thought through. Because everyone knows when you get back, you're motivated. But if you don't have a plan, it could just um, sit on your desk for a while, which happened to me that one summer, yeah. <laughs> so um, when the event finally did arrive, uh, we had some, some great positives. The students actually showed up. We had about 50 students from 10 institutions uh, come to that event. And if you're like me, anytime you host anything, you don't think people will actually show up. Uh, that was one of the concerns, too, with not charging a registration fee, um, uh, is that if there was no registration fee, I just felt like, oh, I'll sign up. Maybe I'll go. Maybe I won't. Uh, I'm not committed to it. Um, but they did, everyone, pretty much everyone who showed up. We didn't have any schools completely not show up. We had one or two people maybe um, for personal reasons. Uh, meeting colleagues, that was an, uh, kind of an unanticipated consequence was getting to meet other transfer-minded folks similar to NISTS, people who think about these things as often as you do. Sometimes on your campus, maybe you're the only one who thinks about it for um, you know, 40 to 40 plus hours a week. Uh, and so it was really nice to talk to them about that experience too. Uh, seeing the connections form across institutions was extremely rewarding. 
and then sparking the creativity. Before day one was over, the students from my campus were coming up to me saying, we have to do this, look what Baylor's doing, we have to do this, look what Houston Baptist is doing. Uh, so it was really great to see them think through uh, how this could uh, affect change on our campus. Uh, the flip side of that coin was we had some unanticipated uh, pieces to the summit. I truly, truly underestimated the interest um, of the folks that were gonna be there. The, the largest, I don't wanna say complaints, but the, the feedback we got that was most constructive was we wanted more, um, which I probably should have anticipated if you're gonna drive uh, 20 hours round trip <laughs> to get more than uh, two half days out of it. But um, I, I didn't wanna plan this huge event and to be so daunting that you don't wanna join and I can't get there Friday morning if we're gonna leave Sunday afternoon or something, right? So, I, although my motivation, my, my uh, intentions were good, uh, there was enough interest, we could have made it a longer program. Uh, building in time for AV mishaps. I had an AV mishap before y'all walked in today. I am, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the term cooler at a casino. It's people who work for casino. You walk up to a table and it immediately cools off. No, no one wins money. That's what I am to AV equipment. I am a professional cooler. Um, so if you ever want to sabotage someone with AV, just have me walk into a room uh, and it will immediately shut down. But anyways, um, we had really tight turnarounds being two half days. Um, so people got out of a room, we would have a 10 minute break. We'd, we were planning to start right after 10 minutes. Um, but by the time people took their breaks, presenters made their way back, they were putting in their USB drives that were corrupt drives, so they had to find the presentation in their email, and then that was formatted differently than they intended, and then it's just all sorts of things can go wrong. So plan time for AV mishaps. Um, and then more structure for staff time. So um, again, it was great to meet Brandy and Joe. I don't feel like I talked to them too much over those two days, but um, uh, not a whole separate event for staff, not their own presentations is I think what will be best for us. But when students have their networking time, when students have meals moving forward, that's times we can bring staff together to really connect. And then now I'm gonna hand it over to Joe to talk about his experience as a participant in helping his students. Uh, if you're anything like me, you wanna know, okay, what did this look like? Uh, what, you know, how, how did students respond? How did you find the students uh, that you're interested um, in, in bringing to this event? And why would they be interested in uh, presenting? You know, those kind of questions come up. And so uh, first let me tell you, uh, the feedback that we got uh, was tremendous. A few of the quotes that you saw earlier were um, from, from some Baylor students. And um, one wanted to change career paths uh, because of the, the impact that working with transfer student leaders has made and then the, the fact that she's able to see the, the uh, world um, of student development and uh, higher education and what that could look like for her. Um, another student just, just got a ton out of um, creating the proposal and, and presenting in front of peers um, and, and that kind of thing. So, but to back up, um, for me, we have at Baylor a couple key organizations that I think um, represent our Baylor uh, student, transfer student leaders. Uh, one is the Transfer Year Experience Living Learn Learning Center. So it's a home of uh, transfer students who live on campus, about 200 students, and it's intentionally programmed by um, transfer students. And um, we have a student uh, count, uh, like a, a leadership council that does all the planning for that. And so that to me was an immediate, oh, I need to pull from that group, right? Um, and then uh, this, uh, there's another group, uh, a student organization called Baylor Transfer Council. It's campus-wide student organization, uh, students who live off campus or on campus and, and um, kind of advocating for the needs of transfer students and, and trying to be change agents for the transfer student population. And so uh, those were the two key groups that I, I focused on. Um, who are the leaders in those groups that I could go to um, that, I, that would be interested and capable of presenting and might be able to uh, represent Baylor well at this conference? And so um, 
uh, I, I, at this first year, I handpicked um, a couple people from those two groups. Um, and uh, I, it took a little bit of time. Some, some people, oh, I have a test on Friday afternoon that I can't miss, so I'm not able to go. You know, so it took a little bit of, of figuring out who's available and who might fit that criteria. But um, the, starting probably in early January, I started kind of recruiting for this. But it was all kind of like, um, uh, I, I was doing it quietly because I didn't want it to be uh, known that I was handpicking certain students at that point. Uh, and so I did that. We, uh, I told them, hey, here's the, here's the vision. It's a time for you to uh, grow in connection with other transfer students from around the state. It's a, a way for you to present and kind of speak from your experience. Um, and then uh, it'll be a fun time in Austin, right? So, um, so that's how I promoted it. And um, I had some takers. And um, what we did was we sat down and we talked about some really, um, some things that I thought Baylor did in a unique way um, that could be a benefit to students um, at other institutions and students um, uh, that might be unique um, and that they might be able to uh, gain interest in or, or take away um, those ideas and start to implement at other universities. So here I am sitting in my office trying to tell them a little bit about what a proposal, professional pro proposal looks like. And um, I gave them some examples and, and then had them walk through what they would do for that. Uh, had them head off to their uh, apartments or wherever they lived. And um, then uh, over the, I gave them due dates um, and then had them send it to me so that I could check over things. Uh, had to explain what a learning objective is and those kind of things, right? Uh, but this was a really informative experience for them and for me in terms of helping them understand that. Um, from there, we, we went and were able to present. I think it went well. Um, and, uh, uh, but leaving at that point, uh, we have a lot of energy and enthusiasm for learning from these other institutions, these other students from around the state. And so you, um, uh, you want to harness that energy. And so I scheduled a meeting, um, a, a dinner. I, you know, I p took the students out to dinner. and. Um, we had a discussion about what are some things that we want to implement right away and what are some things that we want to do down the road. And so um, we immediately came up with a few action items, some things we were able to put in place right away, just a few simple low-hanging fruit kind of things. And then um, another um, piece was to, imp um, to implement a Baylor Ambassador Program um, is uh, w one of the things that we're currently working on and hopefully starting up next fall based off of uh, the, the conference and the excitement that students got from hearing from their peers. So um, I, that is where we were. One of the things I want to say though is now that this is becoming perhaps institutionalized a bit, um, I have changed my methodology in terms of how I'm picking my students. And so um, one of, uh, I've contacted multiple staff at Baylor uh, to have them nominate students. Um, and one of them decided to do a, uh, in order to nominate the students, they decided to do an application process. And so they said, hey, Baylor Transfer Council, if you're interested in this, why don't you apply and tell us why you're interested in going. And then um, the student leaders from that organization were able to pick who they want to send this year. Um, on the other end, uh, the, the other thing that uh, the criteria that I looked for was making sure that they were not graduating, right? This event is this month. It's, it's in February. Last year was in March. And I didn't want them coming to this event and then graduating in two months and heading off. And so um, my model now is every student that is going is going to return for at least one year. And um, my returners, uh, so my returners, my students who have gone to the summit in the past must present in order to go again. It's kind of a rule of thumb that I tend to have for conferences that I go to, is if I've been there once, I should probably at least submit a proposal to try to, to present the second year, right? And so that's the kind of model I've taken uh, for my, my students. And um, uh, I think it's, it's re reaping some great rewards in students who are really excited about, um, about being involved with it. 
So I'm going to talk about how my experience was a little bit different than Joe's. Um, I actually have a group of transfer ambassadors that I oversee. So selecting students for me was kind of obvious that for that first year we were going to th have those students. It actually worked out great. I have six of them. Uh, two weren't able to <laughs> attend, so we had five of us going. It worked out really well. Um, so those transfer ambassadors are kind of the voice and the face of transfer students on our campus. Pretty diverse. Um, they represent lots of different students. Um, they are leaders on our campus. So especially for that first year, that was pretty obvious that we would select those students to go. Um, so we talked about it. We have weekly meetings. We had a conversation about it. They were super excited. Um, Two of the four students I have had never hardly been anywhere in Texas. One is from New York and one is actually an international student. They had never been south of the Texas Panhandle. And so it was really exciting. So that made for a very interesting trip um, drive through Texas as well. But they were very excited to get to go and have conversations about things that were happening at other institutions, whether it be this big giant institution, a private institution, um, all across the state, are they having the same challenges and opportunities we face? Um, so that's how we identified the students. I did not require last year them to submit a proposal. I said, hey, are any of y'all interested in it? A couple of them were. They were like, yeah, this will be a great experience. I want to do this. So how we handled that was I said, OK, let's, we talked and we chatted about um, potentially some topics and they kind of wrote it and we looked over it made some edits and they submitted um, for this year my requirement was if you're going you're at least submitting a proposal even if it's as a group uh, again just to get that experience um, these are upper class students they're going to grad school they're going to get jobs soon it's great experience for them to get um, that speaking ability or and work on that um, during the days, my group was super excited. They were so excited to be there, so excited to learn more. Um, the first day we went to eat afterwards, they couldn't stop talking about it. It was They were so excited to really know that they were not the only ones who were really excited to be transfer students, were really proud to be transfer students, but that some of the challenges they faced, students at UT, which is you know, five times as big as we are, are facing those same challenges. So that was really exciting to get to meet a lot of people um, through day two. And again, we had an eight, nine hour drive home. We talked the entire way home about ideas and things we could do. Um, I mean, I don't think they stopped talking for the entire drive home because they were so excited and so motivated to get back and they said, hey, can we schedule a meeting with the president? Can we schedule a meeting with the vice president um, to really talk through these ideas? And so that was great. We had the handouts provided. We, we, do, we have a meeting every other week. We were able to come back, sit down. You know, Their homework before the meeting was write your ideas down on that. I think it was a green sheet of paper. And then we're going to take those and really work through um, what y'all want to accomplish over this next year. So, um, can I talk a little bit about our assessment? Um, informally, we had some interesting ways to assess what was going on. Uh, so, like I mentioned, during the opening session, students uh, were talking about just their transfer student experience in general, the good, the bad, the ugly, best resources. So, they had these big um, pieces of butcher paper out on the table, and they um, marked down uh, what were uh, advantages of being a transfer student, disadvantages of being a transfer student, and then support. Uh, and then we had them go around with these stickers and mark what were the most, um, what pieces resonated with your experience the most um, at the other different tables? What was the most salient issue to you as a transfer student? So at the end, you, know, you can see some of those have three, four, five uh, stickers next to them. You can see these were our top common um, unifying experiences as, as transfer students. And we shared those uh, at the end of the, uh, at the closing session. We shared here are your top three. Um, advantages to being a transfer student, disadvantages, and top three support systems. Uh, we had two forms of formal assessment. One is for the uh, presentations. These are the questions that we asked. The top two questions 
Um, we shared with um, all the different staff members who were in attendance so they could learn about what their students got out of the sessions. And then those last two questions we only shared with the presenters, actually the, only the lead presenter and they could decide to share with their other presenters um, because it was for their own growth as professionals and as um, as you know, presenters. And so um, we left the questions pretty broad so they could speak directly to the student's speaking style or the um, visual aids they use or the content. Um, uh, just so we weren't asking 100 questions, just what's the best and then um, how could it improve? At the very end, we had, uh, during our closing session, we had a more formal evaluation. Um, we did all of that while they were there, just knowing that once you leave campus, you're less likely to complete the assessment. Uh, and then again, you can see um, uh, for some of the questions, I would tally together answers. Uh, but I shared answers to all the questions with all the staff in attendance. Again, um, as the host, I didn't want to just have this information for myself, but to share it with all the schools that were in attendance. Bringing the su summit home, um, we were really excited about all the different ways um, our students were excited and wanted to bring things back to campus. Uh, the example I'll give you is that we had casually thought of the idea of transfer student housing um, in our office, but hadn't really thought too much about it. But after the Baylor presentation on their um, Living Learning Center, um, we started to make uh, moves this past summer to start a living learning transfer community at UT, and then we're gonna offer that this next fall. Um, so over the summer, I had uh, a couple conversations with Joe on the phone, um, through email, just to learn about what are their goals and purposes, um, so I had a better idea of um, some of the, the, the challenges he's come across, so I could kind of um, get caught up on what to expect. Um, yeah, and that was something that that was one of the uh, main things our students walked away with saying they wanted and that they were excited about. And so, um, you know, a year and a half later, it looks like we're gonna have that on our campus. Um, and Brandy, talking about the renewed confidence. Yeah, my students just went back and they felt like they really had a voice. They always did, but they felt comfortable speaking, you know, that they had something to back themselves up. Um, when we had conversations with President Windler and Dr. Johnson, that they could say, We've learned this. This is not just something we're facing, uh, but this is something we can do because we've talked to other students. This has worked at other institutions. Um, we feel confident that we can do that here. And Joe? And, and as mentioned earlier, um, we, we took away the idea of uh, the um, ambassador program. Uh, we made some headway with it, um, with admissions, working with admissions to do, do that. And then the key person, key stakeholder in admissions uh, changed positions at Baylor. And so then we kind of got back to square one. So I'm still working on that. But, um, but uh, that was probably the, the one uh, key, uh, tangible, uh, large picture thing that we, we started moving forward with. Great. So planning for year two. Um, where the planning pretty much happened in our office uh, for year one, reached out and we have about five or six, Joe and Brandy are both on a, a, a planning committee. Uh, so Brandy took the lead in all of our session, our call for proposals. Um, and uh, Joe is helping out with a networking event. Um, we expanded it to be about a day and a half. Uh, we are including meals this time around, which was a, a big ask. Uh, funding. Uh, uh, I reached out to our state higher ed coordinating board. Um, I just wrote a cold email to someone I had met for five minutes once, and they passed it along to someone. Um, we haven't secured funding yet. It might just be we're starting really far in advance for year three. <laughs> um, but uh, it sounds like it would be promising. We also want to look at maybe some um, privately funded uh, groups that are interested in higher education achievement in Texas uh, that might have some funds for this. Um, again, really for 50, 60 people, um, it's, it's not a ton of money. Um, but uh, if we were to find even more support, that could certainly go to help people with hotel costs and travel costs. And so not only is it, um, would it help for hosting, but for attending the conference as well. We also changed the date. We moved it up. We had that problem of uh, for my students, we had a lot of seniors in attendance, and they only had a month to 
get their ideas to the next group to, or to implement. And so I really wanted to move it up. Um, the only problem is in Austin, Texas, the entire month of March is dedicated to South by Southwest. Uh, music, film, EDU, interactive, et cetera. So you cannot book a hotel room uh, within a 200 mile radius, it feels like. Um, and so we had to either go, move it up all the way to February um, uh, or keep it at the end of March. And so we moved up to the, to the end of February, comes with its own challenges. Students did not begin submitting proposals until late January. Um, um, whereas if they did that in still a couple of months, it gives more time to work on those. But um, uh, it's, you know, we'll see how it goes this year. Uh, hopefully it gives them more time to take that information back and do some more good on their campuses. But that was the motivation, so we'll see. Yeah, and so um, this was our, our full group after day one. Um, and we we're really excited to have just a really great group of motivated students. Um, um, and it, it really had an impact on our campus, like I said, in our programming, adding uh, a living learning community, but also just in our students feeling recognized on campus. Um, it's, it's something that I feel strongly about that students should have pride in the label of transfer. I was a transfer student myself. Uh, I think it shows hard work and resilience. And um, I think whenever I hear people say, you know, should we have labeled that transfer or something? Are, are students gonna show up? Do, I, th do they think of themselves as transfer? I'm kind of tired of that question and I really want to help grow, like build strength in that label and give them something that they have pride in. Um, and so that's why transfer is certainly the first word in our event, because um, uh, that's an, a, a huge part of what we're trying to accomplish. I know we're kind of at the end of the time, but does anyone have any questions? Yes. I have a question about the age range of people that didn't participate. Are they, it looks like they're mostly traditional students, people that get 18 to 27? Yeah, I would say that most of the folks who attended would fall in the 18 to 27 range. Um, uh, I know on our campus this past year, there's been an effort on having a, um, more involvement for students 25 and up. Um, and so uh, we hope to have more representation there. Yeah. And I can speak for my group. My group is not necessarily traditional, all traditional age. It happened to be the ones who were able to attend that at that point were. But in general, I would have, I, I mean, some years I would have been able to take somebody quite a bit older. Yes. Expanding the number of attendees. And you said you'd keep it at 50? Um, yeah, so I think we would expand if we could find some funding. Um, I also just, it's really complicated with my department. We can't take in fund, we can't charge fees for events. Um, and so any funding is either gonna have to come from externally or we just scrap it together from um, different parts of our, our academic unit. If, um, if you did expand it, would mm. you Oh, is there enough interest? Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will say that we have some new schools attending this year. Some uh, aren't able to return. Um, I think that we could probably keep growing it. And I feel like half the battle is finding the staff contacts to invite the students. Um, but I think there's, there's areas to grow, yeah. Yes, I think last question. How much was all this? So you keep talking about funding, we <laughs> yeah. $1,500 for the hotel, but total cost. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so for, for this year, I don't know exactly how, we, it's almost gonna come out to, it's barely gonna be more than last year and we're adding two and a half meals. Uh, it's gonna be under $2,000 still. Um, last year was, uh, I had budgeted closer to 1,300 with no meals. Um, it ended up being a little closer to 1,500 because uh, I didn't ask for table linens early enough and that was a $250 charge. Um, but yeah, so, uh, yeah, but I, I think you could honestly do it depending on how you're structured. You could do it for 50 people for $1,000. All right, if you have any other questions, I'm sorry we didn't, kind of ran out of time. Uh, we can stick around to help answer those, but thanks so much for participating.